Okay, everybody, I hope that um, you guys are getting this. I tried a couple of times and it wasn't working, so I'm going to hopefully get some feedback here soon that all of you can hear me. And this is something that I'll be doing every week. The time changed because yesterday I wanted somebody to tune in and they couldn't and I really couldn't um, just pull it off. And so I'm doing it today, which is a Thursday, but it's going to be every Wednesday at nine o'clock. And if you have any particular questions or areas that you think that um, I need to cover, if your child is struggling and he or she is in kindergarten through, let's say second grade, which is really when we want to um, get them up to speed. We want to really catch it on before um, they're in third grade. Sorry, guys. Um, so if your child is in those grades and you really want to get them up to speed, then definitely email me any questions that you have, and I will try to address the topics that you guys are having an issue with. So today, it being the first one, um, I'm not going to go too in-depth um, as to the topics or the questions that usually come up, but I am going to talk about the setup of whenever you have a child that is struggling to read, what are the, some of the things that you can do to kind of um, set up a remedial or an intervention that you would do at home? First and foremost, you have to realize that your child already knows that he or she is struggling. And so recognize that you're frustrated with the process, your child is frustrated with the process, recognize that from the time your child was in, was in kindergarten, he or she was already um, segmented in a group that he or she knows really is aware of the fact that they're reading below grade level or behind. And so sometimes when parents come to me and they're frustrated, they're not realizing that the child is already frustrated um, to begin with. And so you're you're working with a child who already has a defeated spirit. You're already working with a child that feels down about him or herself when you're going to go work on your words or work on your reading. Your child automatically um, can put up a, a wall because that child already knows that, hey, I need to work on this because I'm doing badly, because I had this bad experience, because I didn't make a mark, because my mom had to go to teacher conference. So all of those negative emotions are going to come up. And what we need to do is preemptively kind of nurture that child and speak life into that child, speak hope into that child, and really um, just be very nurturing and aware of the fact that we're dealing with a broken spirit. It's not just the child that is struggling with phonics or struggling with with reading, but really at that point, the way that their school systems work, by the time that, you know, you know, a lot of times we have parent-teacher conference with the child right there. And so the child is listening to things and things are being reiterated in front of the child. That Those messages are getting into their subconscious mind. And we really have to filter out all of those things um, before we can see improvement. And so when I work with a child, um, Sometimes the reason that the children are responding to me is because I didn't sit through all those parent-teacher conferences because I'm not bringing all that baggage. I, I never struggled with reading or I don't, um, I didn't feel embarrassed or I didn't feel frustrated or I didn't feel, you know, sometimes we feel ashamed when we go to a parent-teacher conference and the teacher tells us our child is not producing. So when I work with a child, I don't, I'm, I don't have any baggage. But when you work with your child and your child is struggling, you are working and bringing that baggage and that negative charge. And so now you have your negative charge that you're bringing on top of that child already coming into the, you know, into work with, um, work on their reading with their own baggage. And you have two people um, because your children are people, and you have two people really coming into trying to do something positive, but they're already feeling defeated. You feel like you can't teach your child and you don't understand 
why your child's not getting and getting it and the child is already struggling and has all these other things playing in their mind they're already thinking again they need help they're not good at reading they're struggling they're in the slow group all of those things that they're struggling with you come together and you wonder why you don't see improvement um again when i work with a child i just come to it with an open mind um and so sometimes even that alone is why i see the improvement or i can get results and so your job because you're working with your your child not me is to just kind of let it go you know you let it go and you realize hey for whatever reason we struggled with this before this is not you know a life sentence now we're gonna deal with it now we're gonna work on this together and it's gonna be okay and it doesn't mean that I was a bad parent and even if you made mistakes in the past it's okay now you're taking charge and now you're gonna do something about it and now your child who's brilliant is going to have these skills that they didn't have before and you guys are gonna make it and you'll be all right so it's very important that first and foremost you um, counsel yourself, you nurture yourself, and you bring good energy to the space. So bring good energy to the space. Make sure you're hydrated. If you need a glass of wine, make sure you do that. Um, whatever it is that kind of gets you in a good space, um, do that first so that you're, um, when you approach your child, you're not bringing your own baggage. With that being said, um, and the next is that you would deal kind of with debunking your child. So some of the things that I do and that I do with children and with myself is that I teach the, my clients to do is to um, do the things you when you're starting to work on a child's tough subject, if it's literacy, for example, you want to do the things that you do to debunk anyway. So bring out your toolkit. And you might think, hey, Nikolai, this has nothing to do with literacy, but it does. And it's important that we recognize that we're not just, that we're not machines. We're spiritual beings. We're emotional beings. It is a fact, a neurological fact, a brain science proven fact that we perform better when we feel loved. We perform better for people who make us feel loved. We perform better when we're not stressed. And so these are just, this is just the way that our brains work. And so, you know, it's very important that you know that when, we're, when you're stressed, the learning part of your brain, which is in the front. So your messages come from the back to the front. And whenever your emotional brain is kind of compromised, you can't tap into your learning brain. So it is very important that your emotions, that you're in sync with your child, that you're in a low level of stress before you try to learn a new skill. So it is very important that you talk about your child, hey, with your child, this might be a little bit challenging and we've had trouble in the past and this is an area that we need to work on, but we're going to do it together. And I believe in you, the reason that I'm working on you is because I want you to succeed. I'm on your team. I'm here to lift you. If you feel frustrated, please speak up. If you feel threatened, if anything that I say, like let's create this space, space where if anything that I say offends you or troubles you or hurts you, that you feel comfortable with telling me. Create trust between you and your child. Make sure that you say, if I, if you feel scared, if you feel that you can't speak up, if you feel that you can't tell me that you don't understand, tell me. Let's work on that. And your children need to know that you're, that you're vulnerable with them, that you feel scared and you feel frustrated and you feel nervous with them too. And that is very important. So learn that your children are carrying baggage and that so are you. By the time that a parent comes to me or by the time that a parent admits that their children are having a hard time with literacy and are struggling readers, there's already baggage there. So make sure that you're releasing the baggage and make sure that you're nurturing and making yourself available emotionally and spiritually to your child. 
that is going to make the difference. I can teach you about phonics and listening sound, all, all these games. I can do all of those things. But know that if you don't connect with your child, that your child will suffer because of it. So it's very important that you connect and you start to bond before you go into an area. And this is the same thing if your child is struggling with math, whatever the trouble area is, discipline, whatever the trouble area is, before you start practicing a technique or addressing the issue, you have to take time to deal with your baggage and you have to take time to emotionally connect with your child. Once the levels of stress go down and once the energy has been cleared and once the, your heart has coherence, then the mind is able to, to open up and then your brain is able to learn and to, to remember. Then memory is activated. So there are things that you have to do. That is the first one. If you're a person that believes in saging, I think is very good, or burning Palo Santo. So if you believe in burning something, and if that makes you more relaxed and cleanses your energy and cleanses kind of your space, if you're having a stressful day, I'm pretty sure that the same thing applies to your child and the same thing applies to going over a literacy session. So it's so funny because sometimes we do all of these things. Like we realize we have to, like before a presentation at work, we realize that we have to prepare ourselves. We realize that we might have to visualize. We re realize that we might have to affirm and say positive things to ourselves. We realize we might have to breathe. We have all these tools that we use, but here we come, like schoolwork is your child's life. You know, parent-teacher conference is like your evaluation at work. I mean, these are big things. Not being able to read or struggling to read when reading is, you know, the bulk of your child's academic experience. It's everything. And so we don't want to do and use the skill sets that we have in other areas of our lives when it comes to academics, academic interventions, and things that have to do with our children. No. The same things, your people. It's the same brains, the same mechanisms, the same body, the same physiology. And so it's very important that you address your child's emotional needs, physiological needs, biological needs. You can't go at this if your child is already struggling and not address those needs. So sage, drink water. A lot of our children are completely dehydrated. You have to understand that the way that our body, um, that our bodies are electric, that our brains are some, a, a lot of the electricity and a lot of the motion that's going, the energy flow that's going on in our bodies happens in the brain. That's why we usually have heavy metals, the positive, the positive, the positive mostly in our brains and they affect our central nervous systems because we have a lot of energy obviously in our brain is our computer. So the way that energy is processed through the body, right? It's through um, the way that the energy conductor basically is um, our water. So the water molecules we all know that water conducts energy. And so the molecules from the water are what helps that energy flow through our, through our bodies. The problem is that a lot of us are dehydrated. And so anytime that we want to go into a situation where we want to learn, we want to have memory, we want to have increased focus, then we have to give our body more of its conductor which is water. So we have to make sure that we're hydrated. We cannot be drinking juice. Juice is a food. We can't be trying to drink coffee or, well, well children, not coffee, but um, pop, soda drinks, or any other drink other than water. We can have a belly full of food. So now our brain is in that, I mean, our body is in digestion mode, not in learning mode. And so we can't have we just ate that's to me not a good idea so usually i try to say you know make sure your child is not hungry but not um not don't try to do the work of anything that you're struggling with right after a meal because your body is going to be digesting it's going to be less alert and so make sure that you're not you know 
just finished stuffing yourself with dinner and then trying to um, take on a um, literacy intervention proce um, process and make sure that you're well hydrated because the conductor in the because water is your body's conductor for electricity. So you want to make sure that you're not dehydrated. So if you're a person that likes to sage, sage. If you're a person um, that likes to burn something else to kind of like release negative energy and negative charge, do that. Cleanse your body of, um, of negative energy and all of that baggage that you have, not just from your day, but from your previous experiences with literacy. Take the time to connect to your child. Take the time to say affirmations to each other. And so have your child say something positive to you, mommy or daddy or grandma, uncle, like, thank you so much for being such a good teacher. Thank you for being my guide. You're a wonderful teacher. You have so much patience. You, um, whatever, Get, have them speak things to you and you take turns. You're a great learning learner. We're in our this team, this thing together. We're going to learn our words today. All of those things take just a few minutes to speak life into each other. So I say, sage, drink water, make sure that you're vulnerable. You make an emotional connection. Speak things into each other, and these things don't have to take long. So we're talking about just you know a few minutes, five minutes, six minutes. That is going to put you in a completely different space. And now you can be open to learning. And I'm sure that many of you guys have never done these things, but new things, new levels of achievement require new things of us. Um, I also like to have crystals. If you use crystals or magnets, um, have them on my lap or I'll have them, you know, in my child's pocket or if it's magnets, usually I have magnets in, in their pockets, anything that kind, kind of centers them and could draw a lot of energy so that it's focused, I think those are great tools and they make us feel good. If you have children, particularly with ADHD or hyperactiveness of any of those things, it's even more important that you can include these elements because a lot of the time, the reason that you have that behavior problem or that you have that issue, uh, that physiological, those jitters is because there's a lack of balance. And so before we tackle something that they're already struggling in, you want to make sure that you add elements of balance um, in their life. It also kind of, because it's different from what they're normally doing in school, it kind of shifts um, them into just a new energy and a new frequency. And it kind of gets rid of all those cobwebs that they have um, that have to do with school and all the issues they deal with at school. You kind of have to create a different space. So um, those are kind of the things that I have environmentally that I like to make sure that I share with my clients and that we do them with the children. There's, um, so today I'm going to talk about little tools that don't have to do with particular skills, but that are important. So the emotional ones um, I've talked about. Now I want to talk about um, some other tools that you can find right on YouTube that are very good. And there are two in particular that I have my clients do. One is called Brain Gym. I took a class with... Um, Oh, she's like a world, she's a world renowned, she's an amazing educator, Carla, Han Carla Hannaford. And I really love her book, Smart Moves. It's amazing. I should have had it. I should show you in one of the next ones. But um, it's called Smart Moves, um, Carla Hannaford. And she is amazing. And she, her work really is about how you have to incorporate movement into into learning and how incredibly important it is because we're not just brains. Um, it went from like brain learning to brain and heart and her work really looks to brain, heart and body and making sure that we're attending the whole child and that the whole child is, you know, obviously all of the elements and the bodies included. And so she's really good with movement. Um, and so she introduced me to brain jam and, um, 
Brain Gym is just a series of movements. It's like copyrighted and licensed, and you can be certified in it or not. Um, but it's really like 12 movements. It's very easy to do. You can YouTube Brain Gym moves, and you'll see that it's just a few uh, movements that you can learn. And what I like to do is that I like to do a few of those brain gym movements at the beginning, at the middle of the session, and at the end of a session. And so just take two or three exercises that you feel good doing that are part of brain gym. Again, just look them up on, on YouTube and just practice them with your child and do them with your child. What brain gym does is basically you have this side of the body and this side of the brain. And the way when you have coherence, when actually they can, your learning actually increases when the brain is merged, when the both sides are kind of working in sync. And when you have brain heart coherence, um, your, your body can heal and it can learn better. And so all that is doing is that it's taken, it's a lot of cross lateral movement, right? So it could just be like, you know, this, Right, just even that. <laughs> I look funny doing it. We all look funny doing it. So just do a few of the exercises. Some are with your hands. Some are standing up. And so they're very simple to do. And all that they're doing is they're either touching on a particular nerve or they're just having controlled cross lateral movement that will actually integrate the brain. And now you're integrated. You have coherence. And now you're ready to learn. And so just do a couple of brain gym movements before. And again, this is very, very important to do with children that have um, ADHD, behavioral problems, or really anytime you do an intervention. So you can do some at the beginning. When you take a little break, do some, and then at the end. And that'll help with the memory, the end, of course. And so that's another tool that I think you guys should use. The other one is called Hemi Music, which again is about integrating the two hemispheres of, um, of the brain. And you can buy Hemi Music. It's very good um, for relaxation. It's very good before a test. If any of you guys, um, your children are taking standardized testing, uh, sorry about that. Um, I know some please get with other parents and try to opt out. I know that people think you cannot do that, but parents can come together and teachers can come together and opt out of standardized testing. That's another whole different webinar, but know that that is an option for you. Other than that, I, it's very important that you guys know that you can do, um, Listen to Hemi music because it will, again, integrate the brain. Just like brain gym, when you have your brain integrated, then you can learn better and you can memorize things um, a little bit better. And so your children will do better with that intervention if, your child, if that brain has been integrated. So with Hemi music, the way that it's recorded, the best way to listen to it is with headphones because what they'll hear on one side of the headphone, the earphone will be different than the one on the other side. And be, be, once they listen to it together, then that integration um, happens. And of course that is recorded at a different frequency that is also, um, more stabilizing for the brain. And so Brain Gym and Hemi Music, those, they actually have it. You can buy the CD and you can, um, you can, re, you know, downplay it and put it on your child's with headphones, or you can look for videos on YouTube and you can just, again, with the headphones and play it. So do some Brain Gym, listen to some music on YouTube with the headphones, and you can do that at the beginning do it some in the middle, do some at the end, or just at the beginning of the, and the end. But those are tools that you might not be using and you might not be thinking that they have anything to do with literacy. So when I'm doing a literacy intervention, parents are automatically thinking that we're just gonna go straight into phonics, straight into listening sounds, straight into you know doing the hard work. That stuff is important. But we have to address other things. We cannot continue to do the same thing. It's not. Having a successful literacy intervention is not just about 
find some more workbooks and some more worksheets and some more flashcards and drooling your child in beating his or her energy and self-esteem to a pulp and thinking that you're going to have a child that produces. We have to nurture our children and we have to att attend to their physiological needs, to their brain needs, and to their emotional needs before that we can have a successful literacy and intervention. So again, today's topic is tools for us to have um, going into a literacy intervention that are not necessarily our more traditional ones. Um, and I think that these are all things that have to take, you know, that you have to do if your child is struggling. Um, so I'll say that and, you know, just have those elements, not just one time, but be consistent. You should have these elements and you should work on those elements every single time, every single time you work with your child. The other thing is that if you, your child is having, and this is true of numeracy, same thing with the math. If your child is not mastering the basics, the foundation is not strong, then your child is not going to succeed. That being said, when your child comes, by the time you and your child sit down to do homework or literacy intervention or your work on your math, whatever, and you know, between that time and the time that you have to eat dinner and wash up and go to bed, you know, you just have a limited amount of time. I'm not telling people, and sometimes teachers don't agree with me, but I have had teachers that do agree with me. Um, I'm not saying that doing homework is not important, but most of us don't remember what our grades, our homework grade was in first grade or second grade. It's not really like a determining factor on our success and our life. And so know that if you have, you cannot do your literacy intervention or your math intervention, um, and then also do two, three hours of homework and then have that child, their sleep now is compromised. So know that sometimes if you have a struggling reader, maybe for a month or two, they might not complete all of their homework. It's okay. Because once you're really, because clearly you were doing their homework before and for whatever reason, now your child is not reading and it's not performing or doing math and it's not performing. So work on that foundation and it's some, don't compromise the time that you spent on a literacy intervention or a math intervention for the sake of doing homework and do not compromise their sleep for the sake of that either. So sometimes know that when your child is struggling in a particular area, whether really struggling, whether it is literacy or math, you have to know that their report might not get done. This is, you know, we're talking about K through second grade, even third grade. If your child is struggling, it's time to save your child. It's time to really, you know, the foundation is broken. So doing some work for homework might not be the best thing. Making sure that you're doing these things and that you're um, building and strengthening their foundation, that is very important. And so that's another thing. These things take time, interventions take time. You have to work, if your child is struggling to read, you have to work on literacy every single day. It's like life or death because your child is not gonna make it without a strong literacy foundation. If your child is struggling in math, the problem is not gonna wait. If your child is struggling in addition, it's not going away because, you know, multiplication is coming right next to it. If your child is struggling in multiplication, it's not going away because the next lesson is here. Now he or she's gonna struggle in division. And so your child, if your child is struggling in kindergarten, he or she's gonna struggle in first grade, second grade, third grade. You have to address these problems. So focus on building that foundation. If you make the foundation strong, the homework gets easier. The reason that the homework is taking so long is because the foundation is, is broken. And so if you're getting a bad report, focus on that and know that sometimes in the process of doing this, and it has to be done every day, homework time is compromised at times and know that that's going to be all right. That's my two cents about homework. So you're doing these things and um, you have to do them every single day. Know that. Here's um, a few other things. When I set up my table, I always, I try to have a space, like a piece of car car carpet like this. I think this is from Ikea. I think it's like $2. Um, or you can have it, um, you can also get 
like carpet pieces at Dollar Tree or all of those stores. Just make sure that they don't have a lot of colors. You kind of want to get a solid space for your child to work on. Especially again, if you have children that are struggling to read already, that which has emotional baggage, or if they have problems with, you know, um, keeping their space with spatial relationships or with hyperactivity. This kind of gives them a little bit of control because you're telling them, or you can draw it on your with tape on your table if you're willing to kind of like keep uh, an area and you're like, okay, we're going to work on this space. And that helps a child focus on a particular area. Um, um, and, and it really ends up helping. The other thing is that sometimes what I'll do is I'll separate the skills. So if I have a child that's really, really struggling with keeping their body together and keeping it focused, I'll say, okay, here's an activity that has nothing to do with reading. For example, doing Legos. You have to do that for five minutes. You have to work on five Legos or you have to work on um, doing a puzzle for five minutes or 10 and I'll time it, right? So I have my timer in the carpet and the skill that has nothing to do with literacy. So it's not working on words or anything like that. And I'll have that child work in that space for 10 minutes or for five minutes. Sometimes you have to build up. That's another thing, because you can't expect a child that's struggling with their body to also, and, and also struggling with literacy, to sit and read and write and do all of those things. It's like they're working on two skills. So it's a lot better if you're having a child that's struggling with, with any physiological type of, or attention type of thing, to work, um, to work on that by itself in that space, um, to work on that, that control using a skill like Legos or puzzle or anything else in a space and learn focus for 10 minutes. We have a lot of children that are working on, that are constantly using apps, are constantly playing video games, are constantly watching YouTube or television. And so they're constantly stimulated, stimulated, stimulated. And then we ask them to focus on an area like literacy or math where they're struggling and not understanding why they're not responsive. And it's because we have not, we have moved away from silencing the mind and focusing on something that's not entertaining and that is not jumping and is not interactive. And so it's very important to create a space, the carpet or that piece of tape, where a ch and give a child a something that's not working with us because that's in still interactive, something that they have to work on that's not literacy, that's not reading, that they have to work with for a time, for a specific amount of time, just to get that focus, kind of bring them in. And so usually I do that at the beginning. Sometimes I do it in the middle of a session and give them five to 10 minutes on something challenging that they have to do, that they have to focus. You may not think that this has something to do with literacy, but it does. Because when we get to reading comprehension, a lot of the times the reason that the children are not able to perform in reading comprehension is because they do not have the ability to have mental focus. And so you have to work on the skill of reading comprehension during a test, a standardized test, they might have to read a passage for 10 minutes silently. If they have not, and then answer questions. So if they don't have the skill of sitting down and focusing on something that's not talking back to them, then they can't do the exam. So it's very important that you work on that skill. Sometimes the problem is phonics. Sometimes the problem is vocabulary. Sometimes there's lots of different areas that we can touch on. But when we start thinking about our second graders, our third graders, even our first graders, and the reason that they're not testing well, sometimes that has to do a lot with being able to have focus of the mind. And so it's good to create that space, that square, where they're working on a physical skill that's not um, interactive and have them focus and make sure that you're timing. So that's another thing. I want to talk about your paper that you're working on.
So one of the things that um, I have to let you guys know is that children are different. I know that we want to standardize them all, but children are different and they have different needs. And sometimes, you know, the devil is in the details. And sometimes, and we have to understand that in, like good writers are good readers and good readers a lot of times are not writers. And the way that we develop readers is by developing writers. This is something that comes from them. We can practice phonics, we can practice <coughs> analytical thinking, I'm sorry, analytical thinking, we practice vocabulary, we practice spelling, all of the skills come together in writing, editing, you know, just all in storytelling, all of those things come together in writing. And so writing is very important, but everybody, um, especially the children that are having issues, you have to think about what kind of paper helps them. So sometimes, and this, you guys follow me on this, sometimes blank paper helps a child because it activates their creativity, because it doesn't have any rules, because it's different from what they're, they're writing it in school. And so blank paper sometimes is great for children. Um, you tell them to write on blank paper and they write something completely different than they do on line paper. <coughs> Apologize. Sometimes the same paper, different child, blank paper is terrifying. I have one of these children. Blank paper is absolutely terrifying for him. So you might need line paper. So get to know your child. If your child is having a problem writing and your child is having a problem with literacy, get to know your child. Experiment. They might need lines. They might need blank paper. Make sure that you identify the obstacles and you get rid of them. Because if I know my child, like, what am I trying to prove? Am I trying to get my child to be an excellent reader and be an analytical thinker and be, be able to um, synthesize a lot of information? Yes or no? Well, you know, it's my point that they have to write in this noble paper. Right now, that's not what I'm worried about. So if it's blank paper, if it's line paper, give them what they need. That's it. It's simple. The other thing is they might still need this primary kindergarten type notebook where you have the space for the picture and then you have the lines and you have a bigger space in between the lines. A lot of children that I work with, we need to end up getting these, um, these notebooks because drawing a picture kind of helps. So if that helps your child, in doing writing prompts, then get this kind of paper. My point is some children need that kind of paper and they need a writing prompt. Some children don't need a writing prompt. It makes them uh, feel constrained. My point is that I can't tell you what your child needs. When I work, first work with a child, I try it all. I, we just figure it out because we're here. I'm not there to prove a point that my system works the best, that my ideas work the best. Every child is different. Your child is different. And so see what works. Do they need a thicker pencil? Do they need a thinner pencil? Do they need a mechanical pencil, an old school pencil, a green one? It doesn't matter. They need some kind of pencil. Sometimes in the middle of a blockage, what I'll do is I'll say, hey, do you need a different pencil? Do you need a different paper? You have ideas, you have words. So you don't need ideas and words. Do you need a picture? Do you need a picture to prompt you to write? Find out. And then the child is like, no, I don't need a picture. I know what I want to write about. I know my words. Do you need a different pencil? Would a different pencil help? Would this kind of paper help? Sometimes you're just going to have to try that. Don't think that you have it figured out. And for sure, know that your child doesn't have it figured out. This is a trial and error. And that's why I think you know a lot of us you know, that comes with being vulnerable and connected. We, our children, when they see that effort from us, they realize my mom is on my team. My aunt is on my team. I'm not doing everything wrong. They don't have everything figured out. We're working together to get this right. And once your child knows that he or she is on your team and that you're on his team and that emotional connectedness is there, then the upper part of the brain, 
this part, the learning brain, is going to open up and then you can have higher levels of thinking. That's what you want to tap into. So paper, space, emotional connection, spiritual connection, um, music, brain gym, movement, make sure that you're hydrated and make sure you have um, timed a time space for you to do something that's different, like a puzzle or uh, um, Kiva planks are great or Legos, something that your child has to do for five to 10 minutes in silence and just kind of doing it and it's focused. Um, I'm just gonna, I'm about to wrap it up, but um, because I'm running long, um, but I did want to do a couple other things that have nothing that you might think don't have anything to do with um, literacy, but you should include this worst Waldo kind of thing or like hidden pictures. Again, you're like, this has nothing to do with the fact that my child is struggling to read. Wrong. We talk about in literacy interventions and we'll do it in another topic, this thing called context clues. We talk about a child being able to remember details about the text. When he or she, when a teacher says, that a student is not testing well, for example, is because for whatever reason, they don't remember. They have a processing um, hiccup. Something's happening where they don't remember details about the text, and so they can't answer questions. They, just, they just don't remember details. Where if you think about what hidden pictures is, and if you think about what worse Waldo kind of, you know, find things that are missing, you have to pay attention to detail. You have to look for details in a picture. And so that is a skill that by practicing the, with these kinds of workbooks, you will develop. Very important skill in higher thinking and higher levels of thinking and higher levels of processing and reading comprehension. How do you practice them without, you know, without drilling your child to death to read passages and answer questions, you do things like hidden pictures and words wall though. The other ones that are really good are the ones that have two of the same picture and you have to identify the details. Why is that so important? Because when a child is reading quickly and has to see the word there, T-H-E-I-R, over there, right? T-H-E-R-E, -E, a child is reading through a passage and has to the faster that the brain can process small differences in letters, the better that um the better the fluency and the better the comprehension. So when you do work with like hidden pictures or identify the difference or the words Waldo kind of thing, when you practice that skill and when you develop that skill, then when that child is reading he or she will have better fluency and better comprehension because the same skill over here which you practice can now be transferred into literacy. So those, um, those are things that maybe don't have anything to do with phonics, don't have anything to do with reading out loud, but they will, by practicing those skills, you will have a child that is a better reader. You're practicing the skill in a different way. With um, with reading and with spelling, you want to do word finds and crossword puzzles. These are great things that you will that will develop your vocabulary and your spelling, and you will be doing that without necessarily doing vocabulary tests and definitions and just kind of rote um, activities. And so, you want to do crossword puzzles and you want to do word finds. That's going to develop vocabulary, that's going to develop fluency, that's going to develop spelling. So take a few minutes to develop those skills using aids that are not drilling with the spelling and the definitions. That's important. And finally, something that I always, always use, which of course is joke books and riddle books. Those will just read a couple and if you don't get it, it's always the best when you don't get it because you're like, I don't get it. And the reason you don't get it is because you don't understand the word. If you understood the word or you understood the spelling or you understood whatever, you know, 
makes the joke or the riddle funny, then you would get it. And so if the child's like, I don't get it, that's an opportunity for you to develop vocabulary, for you guys to look something up. Oh no, the reason is, um, why are waitresses, I just read this one with my son and he didn't get it. Why are waitresses great servers, great tennis players? And it was because they're good at serving. So I had to be like, don't you remember that tennis players serve? That's called serving the ball and waiters serve. That's why they're good tennis players. Those are opportunities for you to develop vocabulary. Remember, a good reader, even if your child has knowledge of phonics, if a child doesn't understand the word, if he doesn't have the vocabulary, when he's reading, there's no comprehension. It doesn't click. So um, introducing riddles and introducing um, um, joke books is great a great tool to break up an intervention session and to develop fluency, analytical thinking, and vocabulary. And so I'm going to wrap it up. I hope that this was a great first, um, a great first hangout, a great first webinar. I'm going to summarize kind of the things that I went through. When you're um, first setting up an intervention, know that you bring baggage to the space, that your child brings baggage to the space. So always make sure that you're attending to the whole child. Make sure that you're connecting with your child, make sure that you're releasing negative energy, make sure that your child is hydrated, make sure that you, um, if you if you use magnets or stones that you have them near, make sure that you're doing brain gym, that you're listening to music that integrates your brain, um, that you create a space where your child in a timed, um, in a time in a set of time with a timer with a limited time is working on a skill and focusing um and the other things that you really work with your child and figure out what types of writing materials and paper and just things that really will help that child be motivated make sure that you guys are constantly communicating make sure that you make yourself vulnerable to your child that your child has the ability to communicate to you when he or she feels pressured those are all things that I kind of went over. And you know, all of that is really getting to the fact that your child, yes, your child is struggling, but there is a way, there are always ways to improve. And I hopefully will become a resource and will give you lots of information that you can work. Um, I thought that, I think this is, you know, one of the areas that I work with parents that I know is really helpful and that people usually don't address. So I wanted to make sure that you guys had a, had a, had this information and again, use things, crossword puzzles, word finds, jokes, um, hidden pictures. Those are things that you might not think are part of literacy and literacy interventions, but they are building other areas that your child will need for test taking and for memorizing and for reading comprehension and answering questions after reading passages. And so definitely they're a part of, they are a part of and should be a part of all literacy interventions at the house. So that's it for now. Make sure that you're following people, um, following us on Instagram and make sure that you let other people know that every Wednesday at nine o'clock, I will be doing a webinar and every single week I will be going over a different skill and um, answering the questions that I get from, um, from you guys. So that's it. Be blessed.